Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze. This is episode 33, Football Players Who Became Pro Wrestlers. I am Professor Jeremy Vilmer, and joining us now is the star of the show, Bobby Blaze. Why don't you get in here and tell them what's going on? Man, what's going on is this. I'm trying to thaw off Miss Damn Winter Vortex 2019. It's, I don't even know what it is, man. It's been crazy here. It's been down in the low, low, low zeros and sub-zero with the wind chills, but you know what? I'm not going out there to test that wind chill out i just say hey if it says below freezing my butt stuck to this chair we went down to six to 25 and today believe it or not it's 40 tomorrow is going to be 60 we are in some crazy weather and i am thawing out and doing good the one thing i was thankful for man is my power didn't go out and i was warm and i appreciate the heat <laughs> when it gets that damn cold because these old bones just can't take it man i'm very um Sitting here very toasty right now, if you will. And it's good to be back on a Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze podcast with my main man, the professor over there. So that's that. And I don't know how it is out there in California. By God, it got cold out here in Kentucky. <laughs> well, you know, my part of California, it stays pretty, we get by weather-wise pretty well. Like I said, I've never had to drive in the snow. What I did notice that with the temperatures this week between, like, Australia's having a heat spell of like 120 some odd degrees. And that polar vortex in South Canada and the northern United northeastern United States, the temperature swing on the planet Earth right now or during this week was wilder than the temperature swings on the planet Mars. Yeah, wow. I just know this. It's cold as a whore's heart out here. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I heard um, someone else mentioned Australia was having a heat wave. I heard that earlier today when I was at the store, actually. Uh, a gentleman used to do some professional wrestling announcements told me that. Uh, he told me that because he knew I'd been to Australia. And also, we both were thought, thought out enough to hit the store at the same time. That it was a lot of people out trying to get, you know. I also think that what I understand is uh, whiskey. Now, listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I'm just I'm trying not to yell at her while this is going on. <laughs> I'm trying to get her to listen to this because yeah. we're supposed to get in about another two to three weeks the way that uh, polar vortex, the way our local weatherman described it, as it works in a big circle, and it does a couple loops, so he said we might expect it again another two or three weeks. Uh, just one of those things, you know. So we'll see, but I'm glad I'm not on Mars, and I'm glad to be here with you, and I'm glad to be warm. <laughs> well, fortunately, I can mute the sound on my side. I don't know what the fuck is going on out there that all of a sudden everybody started barking. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, they're excited about the Super Bowl, man. They that's are. What it is. They are. They um. They like the big sports ball game that's going on today. But if, <laughs> you know, typically in my house, if it ain't if it ain't uh you know like the NWA title, we don't really care though. You know. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm just saying. You know, I it's, think I, I might have watched a quarter or two, listened to a quarter or two this year. This is probably the least football I watched forever. But I will. You know, I'll watch the game tomorrow, man, just so people know we're recording this uh, football players that became pro wrestlers because of the Super Bowl was just kind of, and this was something we kind of had touched upon before, and it's just a very good topic, I think, and it's, it's topic appropriate with the Super Bowl happening, you know what I'm saying? And by the time you get this, the Super Bowl is going to be over with, so I'm hoping, I think Jeremy is too, the game will be ending, and you'll just go right to the Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze podcast. Yeah, hopefully, you know, I mean, like, hopefully whoever you're rooting for wins but half of you that's not going to be the case so some of you can come listen in celebration and some of you can come lick your wounds with us and listen uh in <laughs> defeat and it should be good for everybody that's it man that's it we're gonna make it good for everyone how yeah, about that yeah that's what we're All shooting right. for here you know bobby before we get into our top 10 list i want to give a big shout out to uh manny and nate who delivered the final two nails in the coffin of our GoFundMe for our first 18 months of hosting. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Nate. That's yeah. good shout-outs. Thank well, you. Yeah, that was really nice because Manny threw a couple bucks in there, and then Nate, seeing that that got us within so many dollars of being done, he just went and filled the rest of the thing up. Right on, man. And uh, that was cool. That was really nice. So we are fully funded for 18 months. That's pretty exciting. Today, I'm getting a couple test prints of the new Pin Me Paint, what we were hoping will be the new Pin me pay me shirt and i'll get pictures if it shows up and looks good i'll get some pictures out so everybody can ogle that a little bit thank you yes yeah so uh well hopefully we get some cool stuff coming and everybody a good time will again be had by all (laughs) sounds good man sounds good all good stuff people all good stuff man i'm just trying to get loosened up here in this chair because like i said i've been 
thawing out all day. Yeah. So it's it, the the cold weather has been no joke. That is for yeah. sure. Let's well, let's get started a little bit. Let's before we get to the actual top ten list, let's just discuss some of the people that have come out of football and into pro wrestling. Yeah. Well, there's been quite a few. I know several people that had sent some message and stuff. You know, West Texas State's going to get some love. That was a big football school that a lot of professional wrestlers came out of. You know, mm-hmm. the Funks, uh, Blanchard, uh, DiBiase, and and I shouldn't have said Blanchard because that's that's your favorite. I'm sure you would have got in there. Also, I think, you know, all these schools like uh, Oklahoma, uh, University of Miami, there, there's a lot of schools that I think it's that pocket, University of Tampa. Some of these uh, colleges, man, these guys played football in and just being a right pocket in America at the time with that, you know, just basically they was big, strong holds in professional wrestling, uh, big, you know, hot cities, if you will. You know, so those guys are all very, very good athletes, usually, you know, big, strong and agile and and usually are coachable and willing to learn. And especially on something you can learn to make money at. And I think a lot of these guys saw an opportunity that, you know, once football was over, over with, whether they played, you know, uh, high school, major college or in a pros, they saw an opportunity in professional wrestling once that football was over. And well, I think we've got a really good list, man. So go ahead. Uh, you If you have anyone to add to that, oh, feel yeah. free. Well, I just kind of... I believe Manny Fernandez was uh, West Texas as well. You know, the Raging Bull. Uh, also, I just want to throw out the Von Erichs were all uh, high school and collegiate athletes, many of whom played yes. pro ball. But especially yes. Fritz actually played pro ball in an early NFL team as well. There's definitely a lineage of football to wrestling. I, I do also want to bring up Lyle Alzado, who, yeah. now I don't think he wrestled a whole lot, but he did have a, a brief sitcom about a school teacher becoming a pro wrestler that he starred in. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, that's the, right. the Road Warriors, I think, were in every other episode. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. The guys that, some of these guys, they didn't play a whole lot of football. They just, they were footballers, you know, and they come into professional wrestling. Some of them just, um, you know, like you said, like Lyle Zato and stuff. But some of the things that Jeremy and I, where, I, where I'm getting at it with this, is I don't mean to stumble over my words here, but but basically there was guys on several different lists that, that you may not like our list. But, again, this is our list, the way we do it, because I kept seeing guys that just – and I try to do a little bit of, you know, research. I go from memory first, as I was always try to do, and who I knew about this and that and write down some notes, et cetera. Then I go online and look up some things, and I'm thinking some of these guys they mentioned, you know, like William – with the Super Bowl, keep that in mind, folks. We're talking football here. William Perry, you know, the refrigerator. Big old William Perry uh, played for the Bears, you know, and they won that big Super Bowl back in the day. I don't consider, you know, he got into professional wrestling a little bit, but I don't consider him to be like, quote, a wrestler, you know, that that we kind of, I didn't put him on a list for any reason. With that said, by the same token, Lawrence Taylor, that guy, he just, he was a, Probably the greatest linebacker of all time. If there is any question, it might be Dick Buckus, and you can throw a distant Ray Lewis into there. But Lawrence Taylor won a big match at WrestleMania over Bam Bam Bigelow. Mm-hmm. But but I don't consider Lawrence Taylor a big time professional wrestler per se. Even though they you know he made huge money off of that WrestleMania and a hell of a football player. But he wasn't like a full time wrestler that we kind of are looking at for our list. Does that? That yeah. kind of define how we've done this. Yeah, I think I think what we're talking about are guys who became wrestlers, not football guys who went on to be in a battle royal right. or, or a feud. We're talking about guys who've actually changed their career and yes. and went into pro wrestling, or you know, at, at the very least, David gave it a damn good shot. Uh, I I think most yes. of the guys on here, matter of fact. On our top ten list, I don't think there's anybody in here that really washed out. Everybody right. in here is a star, or or at the very least, they were B team. I mean, they were right yes. next to being a star. Yeah. Yes, and that's why you're the professor because that's the fuck what I was trying to get out there and say. So yeah, once again, a professor bails me out. So hey, professor, how about this, man? Let's get a couple book plugs in. Let's get into our top ten. Our our show is sponsored by Bobby's Books. Pin me, pay me. Have boots will travel, and his other one, I kicked it on to the education of the rest of a wrestler. They both tell different stories from Bobby's career and childhood, going into his wrestling career, and about his life, a lot of good stuff, a lot of great behind the scenes moments, a lot of just real life moments that are interesting to read about. 
if you want to get an idea of what it's like to be a working wrestler, Bobby's books have it all in there. Of course, the the big part on Pin Me Pay Me is the forward is by Jim Coronet, who who really just kind of waxes Bobby's ass the whole time. I mean, he really ta- he really <laughs> he really talks you up. So I mean, that's that's something. I mean, if Jim Coronet, one of the smartest men in wrestling, realizes your value as a pro wrestler in your time in pro wrestling, you fucking said something there. And you can get to Bobby's books by going to tinyurl.com slash blazebook1. That'll get you to pin me, pay me. Or going to tinyurl.com slash blazebook2. That'll take you to I Kicked Out on 2, The Education of a Wrestler. All that does is takes you to Amazon. It goes through our affiliate link, so it throws a couple bucks our way to, you know, kind of help pay advertising costs and things for the show. It helps Bobby sell a book. Please, if you buy the books and you enjoy them, take the time to go back to Amazon and write a review and rate the book. It helps him as an author get to higher on the uh, on the searches and things like that. So, Bobby, now that we've talked about your books a little bit, would you like to say something before we get started at number 10? Thank you very much for the book plugs, and those reviews are important. I appreciate that very much. Uh, let's start with number 10, Jim Danwa Neidhart. Played for USC, played for the practice and preseason games for the uh, – I know he came out with the Raiders and also with the Cowboys. Uh, he was a shot putter, and he got that name to Anvil by throwing a big ass – I don't know how many pounds that was. Anvil and won some kind of a contest, Anvil throwing contest. He was just that big, strong uh, part of the Heart Foundation, and I'm going to let you take over from there because I have like a little short Australian story I'll tell you about the Anvil, about his strength when you're finishing up yours. How's that? For me, Jim, the Anvil Neidhart will always be – the other tag team champion with Bret Hart. Uh, they were, <laughs> well, they were just the dominant tag team when I started watching wrestling in the WWF. They were the guys. Um, to the point that when Bret Hart went on to his singles career, I kept looking at him as a tag team guy thinking, well, where the hell's Jim on Neidhart at? <laughs> um, yeah. Neidhart, I mean, he was just one of those guys that, I mean, he was built like a fire plug. He looked like he could power slam just about anybody he saw. Just, I understand he had his problems, but when he was in the ring, he looked like the kind of bastard to just tear a hole through you to get that pin and get his belt, (laughs) collect his paycheck, and go on home. Jim Neidhart, for me, is just, I guess uh, he was a manic madman on the microphone, and he wrestled the same way he (laughs) talked. I thought Jim yeah, Neidhart he, was great, uh, and he looked like the kind of guy who could throw an anvil. He was just very intense. That's what I was going to say. I think you nailed on the head with what you put him over there. I first remember him coming on a scene uh, back in Memphis. I know he had, you know, went up to uh, Calgary and worked and had been, you know, here and there. But when he came to Memphis, he was this big old strong guy, man. Years later, I got to tour with him. I told one story before, and I'll, I'll rehash it another time tonight. Tonight's not the night to talk about that. But I will say this: we was talking about strength. When I was on that tour in Australia, man, he just, uh, I told you the Australian bus story, and I'll, I'll rehash that another time, but guys like him, he would go in there and friggin' warm up with like three plates on a bench. You know, you go from 135, you put two plates on a 225, three plates is, you know, 315, and four plates is 405. And I don't know how many guys I saw, it wasn't a whole lot that just went in and cold and starved about 315. A lot of guys, you know, warm up, even with the bar or something. But he was just, and then he started working out with like 405, you know, and go from there. And I don't know what he ended up ever benching, but. It was just incredible to see a guy that just, he just sat down underneath 315 and start pumping it out, you know, and then he'd jump up to 405 pounds, and that's when he'd start his actual workout. That's I think that's just a testament to his great strength and intensity level that he had. And I, I also got the impression with that intensity that, man, once he got out there a little bit, uh, I'll go back to that story on the bus later, but um, or another podcast, rather, but, man, you know, I would imagine he was the same way out on the football field as he was in wrestling, just real, real intense and you know how like you said strong enough throw an anvil and win that the guy just um he was probably a really really intense football player all i can say is you know he's just he deserves probably to be on this list and he comes in at number 10 he was just he was impressive in the ring i get his later career kind of suffered because of uh you know well what, what did he call that personal habits or proclivities right. but you know we all got our shortcomings so you know if you're gonna shit on jim the anvil Nightheart, go take a fucking look in the mirror <laughs> you know just don't do it around me yeah yeah, yeah. no i he's over my book for the simple fact man some guys you meet you know they don't have to be nice to you or anything uh, everyone's out there doing their own business a lot of times not only was in australia with them you know he came into wcw there for a while and 
he was always a you know gentle giant of a man. Uh, I didn't get in his way, didn't get in my way, nothing like that. Just one of those things where you you know professional courtesy, you always speak to each other, shake each other's hands, and things like that. And he remembered me from the tour. It was it was you know uh, one of those deals. And I always go by how someone treats me, and he always treated me very very nice and respectful. And uh, it's not to say that he when I was way to be that way. It's just professional courtesy for each other. So hey, that's why I go by. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I put him over hell. Um, pin me, pay me, man. I will put him over. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, let's go to number nine, talking about putting someone over. How about that? Yeah. Do you announce them? Well, number I'll nine. Tell you a story. <laughs> yeah, number nine is Tito Santana. He was the guy who was Intercontinental Champion right after Greg Valentine. So when I first started watching WWF, Greg Valentine had just recently dropped the title to Tito Santana and Bobby Heenan would call go on to call Tito's flying elbow the flying burrito. Yes. <laughs> 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 and I did not know at the time, but he had a football career before he went into pro wrestling, which Bobby will tell us about. Well, he played for West Texas State, believe it or not. Yeah, I totally <laughs> believe go. it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and also I think he played for the uh, Kansas City Chiefs in the NFL, and uh, what's funny is I have felt that flying burrito, and <laughs> I'm sure I've got Bobby Heenan put me over on like WCW, but I've got some, uh, some I don't have them, I'm sorry, I should, I, I've seen some matches that are on YouTube that have uh, uh, me working and wrestling against, you know, some different guys, we mentioned Piper in the past and this and that, back in the day, I went to Dayton, Ohio for the WWF TV, uh, he was doing the El Matador gimmick, and I'm sure that's when Bobby Heenan probably said, you know, when they announced Bob Smedley from the ring, I know Heenan said something like, uh, how would you like to go through the life of Fat Man, a, a moniker? <laughs> and, then, and then, this is what it matches when I probably ate the flying burrito there from, from uh, Tito, that... Um, First of all, Tito was very, very smooth, but he probably, you know, said, look at this, uh, what did Bobby Heenan call it, ham and eggers? He probably called me a ham and agar eating the uh, burrito there, the flying burrito. You know, he was very kind gentleman to me, and he was uh, uh, smooth in the ring, man. He let me call the whole match. You know, he some of these guys, you get to a certain level, you just know, you feel how someone locks up. You know how good someone is when you just lock up with them. And he said, you know, this is what I'd like to get in. You know my finish. And I'm like, yes, you know, yes, sir. No, you know, I know what I was there for. Pin me, pay me. But something Something else I, I just realized when I was doing my research, and I want to just kind of point this out. I, I first played, played at West Texas State. You know who the quarterback was there, don't you, when he played? Who's that? That was Tully. Okay. I think they, they were there at about the same time, if I'm not mistaken on that. But also, I thought there was one person that was a baby face throughout their entire career. We've talked about Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. But you know what? I think Tito Santana always worked as a baby face. I could be wrong on that, and I may be, but I'd never recall him really working as a heel. Do you? I'm just curious. Uh, not... Not trying to put you on a spot. No, you know, here's it, here's the thing. But, but I don't not, recall him ever not doing Not that it. I recall, and I'm trying to remember. Do you remember a short-lived promotion called AWF? And they they brought, they had the round system like the UK has. Tito okay. Santana was there. I, I think there might have been a full season of the show, but there may not have been. Um, was that her? No, that was UWF. Never that was, that was the second that. UWF. Yeah. Man, what a way yeah. to die. Covering yeah. baby oil, hookers, and cocaine. Good God. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was thinking of when you yeah. said the other. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Tito Santana was their, yeah. Yeah, was their champion. And I was just going to say he might have been a heel. But okay. then I remember, well, but then I remembered he was feuding with Cowboy Bob Orton. So there's no way he was a heel. You know, yeah, there's no way Bob sense, Orton yeah. was a face. Yeah. <laughs> there's just no way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, no, oh, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. I mean, I guess that was my long-winded way of saying no. I don't recall him ever being oh, a Oh, that's okay. I yeah. wasn't sure. but uh, So, number nine is Tito Santana. Won't you bring us number eight? Or oh. is it my turn to well, bring you one Well, you know what? Up? I'll do number eight because I'm, okay. always, I'm always trying to figure out if I call this man the natural or hacksaw. And I'm going right. to go with hacksaw Butch Reed before anything else is said. You know, half of doom and also yeah. over his shit in Florida. Butch Reed was a bad, bad, bad man. And yeah. I did not know this, and you pointed this out to me. He was also, on top of being a football player, he was a bull rider, which I did not know. Yes, that's one of the things I always heard about him. I, you know, just stuck out my memory that he was, you know, he had been a bull rider and that he was going to go back to that at some point and done it some. And I guess he's pretty damn good at it. Uh, man, with that said, let me make mention real quickly, Jeremy. Sure. Uh, we're in February. I'm going to mention Black History Month. 
And sometime during this month, it may be the next show or the next two shows, we're going to be doing a show on the uh, uh, your favorite African-American wrestlers. So use the hashtag BBBB. Find Jeremy at the Geekish Cast on Twitter. Find me at Bobby Blay seven forty four on Twitter, or follow the joint account which Jeremy has done a great job with, and that's Bell to Bell Blaze. And just hit us up that hashtag BBBB and and send us some names. I have a pretty good list going right now, but our fans, we appreciate you. And I'm not trying to cut into a Butch Reed promo because he had just hacksaw me right in half, I'm sure. But uh, we're gonna do the uh, the best. Uh, not even the best, just the most memorable and, and, and most famous of the African-American wrestlers in honor of uh, Black History Month. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there for you. How about that? Uh, yeah, that's uh, good. You know what? I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further because I'm always a little confused as to the terminology. Yes. They don't have to just be American in this case. If you've got a favorite pro wrestler from the U.K. or Canada or somewhere else, maybe South Africa Absolutely. or Australia, and you know, I've got friends of mine who are black who say they always use the term African-American, and then I say, but what if you're English? Which causes a whole argument and pisses yeah. my dogs off, apparently. Apparently. Uh, yeah. And, and I'll say this. My age group, I've talked to several gentlemen that I've grown up with, known my entire life, and I'll just flat out have asked them. And I, they say, you know me, I'm just a black man. You know, yeah. I play ball with these guys, and that's just, again, and I, I heard a guy just the other day on a podcast, and he was talking, he, he met another guy, uh, just kind of put this out there, he he referred to him as an African American. The guy said, "I'm from Jamaica, man." You know, or how they say, yeah, it, you know? yeah. Goes, oh, I knew immediately right there. I had already insulted a guy. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and, and I have a couple of Cuban guys that are black skin, but they're Cuban. They have this dark skin, you know. So anyway, it, they could be from anywhere, but we're going for the Black History Month, so we don't mean that disrespectfully or anything like that. If we say African American or whatever. Uh, just send it into the hashtag BBBB because we're going to do that. And with Butch Reed being number eight, you mentioned Doom. And all I can say is, damn, mm -hmm. because number seven is Ron Simmons, Florida State University All-American. He played for the Browns, but he also played for the USFL with the Tampa Bay Bandits. And he was trained by Hiro Matsuda, who's also going to be listed, listed a couple more times and having a hand in some training. But Ron Simmons, man, was just legit, man. He was legit athlete, All-American, you know, for uh, Florida State. And I guess he was... Uh, uh, they retired his uniform, his jersey number. I think it was number 50. I could be wrong. Someone want to fact check that, but I think it's number 50. Oh, God, I, I can't, I'm going off memory off of that, to believe it or not. I just came up with that. I think it was. But anyway, he was um, – word around the campfire was don't fuck with Ron Simmons. And, uh, you know, when, I don't know how long he had that damn thing going on, you know, his catchphrase or whatever. But uh, but uh, I just, you know, the word around the campfire was, don't fuck with Ron Simmons. <laughs> so uh, I guess he could just back it up. And you can go on and talk about some of his other accomplishments if you want there, Jeremy. But he well, was playing in, in football. That's the thing. He played football. Let's, um, let's do this because uh, Ron Simmons was the first black world champion. Uh, I, I know that is something wrestling fans remember, but nobody else really, um, you know, right. casual casual viewers don't necessarily know that. I, he was Cowboy Bill Watts' attempt to have a second black superhero somewhere. Mm. Uh, Ron Simmons deserved to be that person as well, because he was a bad, bad motherfucker. And in his own terminology, <laughs> nobody fucked with him because he was unfuckwithable. There you so, go. Yeah, one, that's one of my favorite. I'm trying to remember who somebody it might be Jim Cornette. Was that or, Arn Arn Anderson? Maybe it was or, Arn. You Anderson. know what? That might be the Jim Cornette. One of those two. Yeah, that's one was, of their words. Yeah, Unfuck, and, well, I say it again. <laughs> Unfuckwithable. And there you that's, go. Yeah. So when, when uh, you're that bad of a motherfucker, you know, <laughs> you just automatically become unfuckwithable. And this is going to be the episode where we quit using the F word as often, and uh, it didn't happen, you know. It didn't happen. Yeah. No. We got two bad but, motherfuckers um, like meant... Butch Reed and Ron Simmons back to back. <laughs> the F bombs just start happening, people. That's what's going to happen. And let me just say. Um, I mentioned he was trained by Hiro Matsuda, and so is someone else that's going to be on a list here. And there was a YouTube video of them training. 
uh, there were several guys on the video at the time that was trading down there in Florida. And so if you go to YouTube, there is a video of Ron Simmons and a few other guys trading together under hero Matsuda. And while you're there, if you don't care, we have a YouTube channel, uh, Big Tex, uh, Cactus Tex, that is, for this week. And we don't expect you taking any Cactus Jack bumps there, Cactus Tex. We appreciate all you do. He's running this YouTube channel, and it's tinyurl.com slash video. That YouTube channel is growing. Jeremy just informed me before we went on lay air. It's gained a couple more I don't even know what was it, 60 more people, I think, since I last checked just the other day. So uh, keep following that. It's tinyurl.com slash video, and we appreciate that. We appreciate you, Tex. And um, so check check out. I'm sure that's that Ron Simmons training videos out there on YouTube somewhere, but check our page out as well. And also look for some videos um, uh, of that maybe possibly popping up in the near future. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm going to say, after I edit our shows, I don't listen to them again, typically. Any of my shows, Geekish Cast or even any of the ones I've done. I do go back and watch the videos because text finds ways to add context and perspective and background information. Um, you know, if, if I quote somebody wrong, he usually has the correct quote plugged in. Uh, it's, it's a lot of good information, especially for guys like me and Bobby who are... The, the history of wrestling is so important to us, both personally and, and conversationally when we do this show, that Tex adds new perspective to things that often we're just kind of bullshitting about. And then he comes along and takes that those sound clips and intertwines them with video and other things that just give them a lot more depth and grit. And, you know, it's awesome stuff. It's definitely worth checking out. And like I said, I don't like to go back and revisit stuff I've done in the past. <laughs> and the fact that I'll do it with these videos just says what a good job he does putting them together. Yes, they are most excellent. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to steal a line from Jimmy Valiant real quick on our next guy here. Mm -hmm. he, fir he first went to Penn State, and like Jimmy Valiant used to say, he went to Penn State, and I went to State Penn, Daddy. You know, <laughs> so, but uh, number six is going to be Lex Luger. He first started off at Penn State, but he ended up at the University of Miami. The U, for all you fans out there of the U, uh, whether you like him or whether you hate him, the uh, Miami Hurricanes, man. Uh, but he played for the Packers in the NFL, then a couple of teams like the, in the USL, like the Showboats out of Memphis, uh, the Jacksonville Bulls, and then I think around the time, uh, the Tampa Bay, uh, uh, bandits, mm -hmm. and that's who uh, Ron Simmons played for as well, the Tampa Bay Bandits. And so Lex Luger, man, the total package, former football player turned professional wrestler and done quite well for himself. What do you say, Jeremy? I have trouble remembering. Now, was he playing football before or after he was fighting with Superman? <laughs> Wait, that's another guy. Sorry, no, never mind. That was Lex Luthor. Forget it. Forget yeah. I even brought that up. Uh, okay, so Lex Luger looked amazing. He had a tendency to, I don't know, not quite half-ass it, but he kind of, he didn't go all in all the time, and yet it still looked good when he did it. He was a fucking powerhouse. He had a body like only a handful of other wrestlers had at the time. You know, I know he gets kind of shit on in reverse. I don't think he... I don't think he was as bad as some people say he was. I don't think he was ever as great as we were told he was. But you know what? He was pretty fucking entertaining to watch in the ring. He, His clothesline looked like it had power. He could lift anybody from a deadlift position. I don't know what else a guy needs to be able to do, you know? Yeah. Well, I think he done quite well for himself coming from the football background because yeah. I know, you know, for a fact that was his first love. And uh, I didn't, I honestly, I have not read his book. Uh, someone did tell me several things about it. Most of it was about his love for football and about his life and everything. I will say this when I was before signing with WCW, Lex Luger was nothing but kind to me. And a couple of times I was backstage negotiating, talking, or what have you before I even came into the territory and or company at that point, whatever you want to call it. And then once I was there, no matter where I saw him at, uh, Lex was very kind to me. And again, I go by one of those things where, you know, I go by how someone treats me, but maybe that's coming back to me as to how I treat people as well. You know, with that said, I, I it's been about a year since I've seen Lex. And uh, once again, as soon as I made eye contact, I was on a panel for Smoky Mountain Wrestling uh, down at the uh, WrestleCade. As soon as I made eye contact when it was over, you know, I walked right up to him. We started just talking and it was a real pleasure to 
see him, and he told me, you know, his son was there running one of the cameras for the uh, the video they were shooting that day. And so here it is several years later since I've seen him, and, you know, we still just kind of – one of those things that uh, he, you know, being at superstar status, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and I've heard different things. I think nothing. I think Lex was just very professional uh, and, and about his business. You know what I'm saying? I don't think that was just Lex. You know, that that was his personality. And, um, you know, he was all about that training and diet and nutrition and, and, and those type things. And, uh, you know, he might have got pushed a little bit. Uh, back in the day really quick before he was ready for that big push but it would, it would have been hard for him not to get that push with that body uh, at that time and also just uh, the way business was going at that time and I think it really panned out well for him at one point for him to be a former professional football player and to take it into the world of professional wrestling and that's kind of what our show's about and again we decided early on we're not going to shit on anyone so wow. I certainly don't have a reason to shit on him I just uh, as you just said some people maybe have this misconception about him or whatever i don't know why because i know i never did and that's what i you know I'm, i have no place to judge another man anyway but he was always so nice to me and so respectful and i think it was because he knew i knew how to work i really do and i think he had respect for that because i do think he did respect the business contrary to what some people may say or believe but um I'm not one of those people. I'm one of those people that say, fuck, Lex Luger was a total package. And I'll say this. <laughs> we, we talk about, we'll go back to Tolly there. And I've said it, it was at the Olive Garden. Then I said it was at the uh, uh, Red Lobster or whatever. But, hey, if you got a Red Lobster card, send them over to Jeremy. <laughs> but T Tolly walk in, and I've told that story. Let me say this. Uh, my girl Lisa, the one I was telling you about back in the day, man, we went to a show on like a Sunday afternoon on Easter, man, and Lex Luger was getting in his car. This is where I'm in the business, just so you know. And, man, uh, Tex put that one video up there. I said she'd be dropping her pay. Dude, she, they was coming out getting in the car. and like Lex in the road, warrior, but Lex was getting in the back. And, man, it was just like uh, one of those things where, like, she was just sitting there just melting. Like, he was in a car in the backseat of the car car man and they pull it out and she just was sitting there i know her panties had to be tripping man so in that regard i think you might help me get laid that day oh well, hey there you <laughs> but, go that came through if, I, if i'd have turned my eye i think she'd have jumped in that car with old lex if she could have you know so you know gotta have fun with this show <laughs> with that Hey, hey you know what? Actually, that, rem that rem down, hold on that reminds me of, of a what? story i was gonna ask you about this one time okay. um <laughs> I don't remember who it might have been when Lex was with the horseman or, or one of those things, but or fighting the horseman. <laughs> but apparently there might have been a tradition of making a guy get opened up what they call, quote unquote, the hard way. Hard way. Yeah. And uh, he didn't want to do it. And they they uh, they got him with like the, the the hood of the car or something to do it. Was that was that like oh, something? God. Was that something like to to really be one of the guys to fit in with the boys? Was that one of those things that somebody had to bust you open once? No, I, it, it depends on what area you're talking about, honestly. I think that there's times that, you know, you've heard about uh, people getting cauliflower ear. Yeah. And, and I just go out there and pop in your ear to, to, to pop it, you know, just to get it out of the way. Yep. And, and, of course, over the years, of course, of working, you know, just build up that cauliflower ear, too. But, no, as far as, like, um, a hard way, uh, if he didn't want to do it uh, – I was never in a position where someone asked me to do it and I was refusing to do it because when I did it, it was one of those things that um, it was part of a program. I just didn't right. go out there and do it. There was a reason with it. I was with the company and making money and doing it. With that said, Dean Malenko, you know, he had been in the business 18 years before he got that big break and he never did it. You know, it's one of those things people and he it's if that happened, I would just say it may have been more of an inside rib when he, when I'm like, you know, hey, we're going to do this or do that. Um, I'm not saying like the old timers didn't say, you know, here's your smarten up, Jack. If you don't want to do it, I'm going to do it for you. Yeah. You know, um, so that that I can't say that that didn't happen to Lex. It could have, but um, I know for a fact that it has happened in a business that someone just give you a hard way, you know, uh, just hit you very just pop you right on top of the eyebrow and give you a black eye real real quickly like i said mention the cauliflower ears and those type things it's um it's one of those things that you know you, you don't have to do that 
to become in the fraternity or one of the boys or to be cool or what have you. Like I said, I only did it when it was regards to making money or part of a program. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, you know, I don't know, uh, that there's necessarily a need for that, uh, unless you are in a program making money. And so if Luger was in that situation to answer your question, whether it be him or someone else, there may have been a time or two that, you know, you got there and whether it be the road warriors or the Steiners or, or whoever, they say, you know what, this motherfucker don't want to do this tonight. He's going to do it. And, and, and it's just like I heard Ricky Morton the other day talking about working with the British Bulldogs. You know, they, the, the attack, the rock and roll work with them. When you get in that ring, you know whether you can kick someone's ass or not. Believe me, they'll let you know quick. And so you, you know, you kind of are guided. And so uh, it may be one of those situations. You put one of Steiner's. You put Ron Simmons in there against Lex Luger, and if Lex don't want to do something, I guarantee it, uh, Ron will make him. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, so absolutely. It, it, I, I'd say that's probably a big yes. So that's my long answer to yes to your long answer of no earlier. Well, but that's it. Well, hold on. Before you change the subject, though, <laughs> I do I do want to say – <laughs> I, I, I do want to say, from I have it on pretty good authority, that if you try to punch Dean Malenko to make him bleed, your hand is what ends up bloody, not Dean Malenko. So I just want to say that's what I've heard. You don't fuck with Dean Malenko. That's that's I'm just that's all I'm saying. No, yeah. No, you don't. No, he is uh, the machine, mm-hmm. and I'm tell you what, he could protect himself. I remember messing up a spot working with the one time down in Florida. <laughs> And I saw him kip up after I did a step over, and I looked into his eyes, and I immediately saw what I jumped out of the ring. <laughs> <laughs> I fucked this spot up. He had told me a couple of times, I got this spot I do in Japan. I got this spot I do in Japan. <laughs> I come off the ropes, and done this, done that, then I was like lost. <laughs> and I saw him kip up, and I was like, whoops. <laughs> and I just buzzed down and hit the ring. Because he had no reason to kip up, because I wasn't in my position. <laughs> and I scooted out of the ring i know <laughs> forget oh. man like oh fuck i'm not i'm not getting him on my pissed off on his pissed off side so uh yeah i took a i took a powder man that was probably uh, that was probably good thinking on your part right then oh it was yeah because i know he would have grabbed me and hooked me and took me that's a bobby what did you do but it, but the thing is with with joe and dean I, when I was at that camp and having, you know, like just that match here, so professional, as I mentioned before, the best craftsman of business, they never once took liberties with anyone or they never hurt me. And I think the worst would have happened is that we went to lock back up again. Dean probably would have said, what'd you do? You fucked, the f- you fucked up my spot and back me to a corner and start something else. So, but, but to cover the match, I think I did the best thing because he kept up and there's the, the, the visible man. And was standing in front of him because I was way on the other side going, now, where was that in that spot? Uh-oh, get oh, the fuck out. <laughs> and I was about to try to hit him in the face or make him juice because I know I'd, I'd have paid dearly for that. <laughs> yeah, I heard I heard the Malenkos don't sleep at night. They just wait. <laughs> Damn. You're getting out there on Chuck Norris level. Yeah. <laughs> or Gene, Gene LaBelle's level. I don't One know. One of those two. <laughs> One of those two, yeah. <laughs> Hey, Jeremy, while we're talking about this, let's do a, uh, before I do a rundown, how about I give a short plug for Amazon Prime? You like Amazon Prime? I love Amazon Prime. Matter of fact, I just discovered last night that there's a channel on the, on Amazon Prime called Power Slam TV that has a bunch oh. of independent wrestling on it, and you get a free day, a free seven-day trial, and after that, it's five ninety nine a month to keep it. I don't know if there's anything good on it. I'm going to check it out this weekend. Um, right on. But it's, you know, if if you try this out, well, Bobby, do our pitch first, and then we'll finish that up. Well, okay, if you'd like to try a 30-day trial, no charge to you whatsoever, with Amazon Prime, you can go through the tinyurl.com slash bb try prime that's tinyurl.com slash bb try prime try for free type that in it's no extra it's nothing like that again the show gets a little bit of kickback from that but i really do think if you're not a prime member and you 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 really do need to think about this because if you order anything from amazon just the shipping alone is is Huge savings throughout the year. Also, the the streaming, the services that are available on that, as Jerry mentioned, I just kind of they have the old Memphis on air. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many great shows. They have original TV. It's it's a really good deal. And here's the deal: after 30 days, if you don't like it, just stop. 
That's all you have to do is stop. Otherwise, you just keep on and you pay your little monthly fee, and it's not that expensive to have because you will save your money on shipping, especially if you download books, read books, have them shipped to you. But it's tinyurl.com slash BB, try prime, and uh, kick back to the show just a little bit there. Even if it's a 30-cent gift card that uh, you might get, that might be towards uh, Jeremy's uh, – Red Lobster uh, meal or something. I don't know. You know, give it a, give it a damn try though. How about that, Jeremy? Give it I, a try. I think that's a good idea. And you know what? I also I, just to throw this out there because there are so many good books about wrestling now. You could also try tinyurl.com dot com slash bb kindle prime. And get your first month of Kindle Prime free, which is basically like a lending library for your Kindle. You get awesome. access to yeah, access to free books. But yeah, Bobby, I found this channel on uh, Amazon Prime, and it's a bunch of independent wrestling shows and things. I I haven't looked. You know, it, it may be garbage, it may not. But you can try it seven days for free through Amazon Prime, and then after that, it's like six bucks a month. So if there is good stuff on there. It might be worth checking out. And look, right now, if there was ever a time to start checking out some independent wrestling, it's right now. Yes. <laughs> you know, it is sure. right now because there is some awesome stuff coming up. Um, I, I do want to say that until a match has been wrestled, all you have is a T-shirt company, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> with that said we're back to the uh, Super Bowl edition of uh, the Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze podcast I'm going to do you a quick rundown 10 through 6 before we get to our top 5 how about that Jeremy? yeah that sounds good <laughs> so like you said how about that Jeremy can I change the subject yet I'm drowning <laughs> over here number 10 Jim Dambo Nightheart number 9 Tito Santana uh, El Matador there the Nat Natural, as you said, or hacksaw. No, you said hacksaw. I said hacksaw. You know what's called you hacksaw. Yeah, yeah. Mister hacksaw to you. Yeah. Let's read. Uh, damn, it's Big Ron Simmons coming in at number seven, and number six we just finished up with Lex Luger there. And with that said, we're going to go into our top five uh, football players that become professional wrestlers uh do you want to start this one off jeremy yeah i do so um this is big leon white big van vader uh a big man a big powerful badass of a man who decided to quit fighting over a ball you couldn't bounce and then go wrestle <laughs> people for a purse and a belt and uh won won quite a few purses and belts as i understand it vader was a bad son of a bitch uh, that that helmet he wore in Japan might have been the coolest thing I've ever seen a wrestler wear. I I just don't, I don't know if people who missed it can understand how big Vader was in the uh, early nineties. Yeah, I just he don't know. Yeah, so big and strong. Um, back to football, he played at the University of Colorado, and with this being Super Bowl weekend with the New England Patriots, they're playing the L.A. Rams, who are back in L.A. for this last year. That's who he got drafted by, but of course an injury sidelined him, and like you said, he got into pro wrestling, and I first heard of him uh, through New Japan Pro Wrestling back in the day when I was training at Malenko's, because the Japanese boys had magazines and VHS tapes, and I was blown away by that helmet gimmick. That was what yeah. that was the catcher. But then once he took that off, he was just such a big, strong, dominating floor, force in, in in wrestling. And especially in Japan in those days, man, I would watch guys um, on those tapes the Japanese boy would have over here. And it would be Terry Gordy and Steve Williams, and it would be, um, and I know they're all Japan, and, and, and New Japan was uh, Vader, just the whole mix of tapes, the way they do their TV. But anyway, I would see these guys just beating the shit out of people. I mean, big, strong, you know, these guys, you know, those, those are just, as you go back to our legitimate tough guys, if we had Steve Williams on there and Terry Gordy was not a man to be messed with. Vader was just, we, we talked about that whole deal. He was just beating the shit out of these guys over there, man. And I was like, oh, my God, this is what I'm getting into, you know. But that was one of my early goals was to go to Japan in, in professional wrestling. But that's where I first heard. And was was when he was in Japan doing all that, and um, you know, for someone that just got out of football with a knee injury, and I think uh, I don't know the full story, but I guess he was sitting in the back, uh, you know, trying to recover from a knee injury, and uh, realized, you know, hey, this this is 
tougher than what I think it is uh, because he wasn't going to be if someone sat around and got beat on. You know, he come into, into the locker room, I think, as a man going, you know, I'm going to make money at this. And he'd done quite well for himself throughout the years. Yeah. So. Uh, Vader, like I said, if you didn't see it at the time, you may not understand just what a bad, bad man he was. That that helmet gimmick coming in. Yeah. The power that he could put off. I it just... Everything about him was something spectacular back in the day. It really was. Uh, he was, you know, just something else. I, I, I don't. He's one of those guys. Like, I, I feel like I need to impress upon people who don't seem to get it just what a big deal he was. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he could do that damn uh, off the uh, shoot, draw up like does a flip off the moonsault. The he moonsault, could do yeah. A moonsault. You know, here's a man over 400 pounds doing a damn moonsault off the top rope. So that's pretty athletic, man, for a guy of that yeah, size. Especially for an oh, arrow man. when big men didn't do that. Yeah, speaking yeah. of size, I'm going to move on to number four, and I'm going to use a quote here. So no offense to anyone out there, but I'm going to tell you, I was on a couple of those pay-per-views back in the day on World War III up in Detroit. And I, we used to go to a powerhouse gym, man. I was there one time with uh, uh, Flash Norton, actually. Uh, Scott Flash Norton and I was working out together. All the boys were coming in and going in and out of the gym. And, yes, this is going somewhere, a former football player. And the owner of the club was, you know, obviously a big bodybuilder. And his wife was with him. And he was letting the boys come in and work out free because it was near the hotels we were staying out and it was really cool and all of a sudden we hear this bill goldberg the biggest juice is moses <laughs> and the whole gym the, the door was nitro girls there and i mean the whole gym just got quiet man and goldberg walked in and he had them big traps as everyone remembers man and he just he walked in and it was like a damn shadow was cast with them traps and there was just a couple other people in the gym at that time because it's like a sunday afternoon because you have to be at the building at one or depending on your schedule but you had to be there by one because it's pay-per-view so you're over there you're like eating and you get to the gym or go to the gym then eat or what have you man the damn place just started because like i said most of it was the boys and people worked at wcw stuff. but he, that owner had invited several of his friends over saying hey you know bodybuilders etc and uh power lifters everyone in the damn gym stopped to look at goldberg and people w wanted to walk up and he took it and I'm going to tell another story in a minute, but he took it with a grain of salt. And then people were like, let me feel them traps. Let me feel them traps. And me and Flash were over doing some different stuff, but it, we was just kind of laughing, and so was everyone else. And uh, we spoke before, and Bill was always real nice to me, let me say that too, because there's a reason why I'm going to set this other story up in just a minute. But, uh, you know, he played football at the University of Georgia, and he played for the Falcons, but he also talked, I think, about for. Um, I think it was for the Rams. He may have been San Diego. But anyway, he was telling a story about um, he was there to do his 40-yard dash, and he fell flat on his ass off the front, you know, off the line. And he's like, ah, you know, just because you're so excited and so anxious and stuff. But he was just kind of telling that to the locker room, you know, that um, he was so nervous, you know, in an NFL tryout. Uh, but, of course, he – Stopped going to uh, football at one point and became a professional wrestler, man, and done quite well for himself. <laughs> Might I add, he's still one of the biggest, strongest. I mean, he's still out there at 50, whatever, went back for a few matches. But he had a hell of a football career for what it was worth. And then, you know, hey, turned it into something. Knew how to turn the dime, man. Instead well, of, I think, with what, being a fitness trainer or something, he said, I'm going to get into wrestling. Yeah. And what was it? He and his girlfriend were, like, what, really big in uh, dog adoptions or something? They used to, like, go around the country doing dog adoption events or it was some crazy veterinarian oh, okay. thing, too. I have to go back and look. I just remember when I read that, you're like, the guy looks like he eats dogs, not, <laughs> you know, he looks like he eats people. So Goldberg is yeah. impressive for, if nothing else, he is the one guy that WCW actually saw what they had and knew how to do something with it. Yes. And that's usually what you hear is like, oh, they didn't know what to do with a Bret Hart. Or they didn't know what to do with a... They had this guy who looked impressive but could only put on like a two or three minute match. And you they know, you discovered that, don't you? Who's that? I interrupt you? you know Bill Goldberg got beat when it was earlier matches. Um, Let's see. Who beat Bill Goldberg in one of his earlier matches? You, you you probably didn't see it and probably didn't know it. This little known fact, Kevin Sullivan. Really? And he said, pull him out right now. 
and he took him, and he took him with uh, Sarge. And uh, you can fact check that, but pretty much from my understanding, Kevin saw the potential. I don't know if Kevin was the one that like put uh, pinned him or how they did it. If it was someone else at a, at a show, I think he was offered to go out even at some point to go over to like Alabama or there around Georgia, do a couple shows, and Solomon's like, hey, don't don't put this guy out there right now. It was something about his. Uh, I think he had a University of Georgia jacket on or something, uh, or a Falcons jacket. I could be wrong about that. But anyway, and Bill didn't want to go to so many smaller towns anyway at that point. He was so – I respect this. He he wanted to make his debut when he was ready because Sullivan had gotten in his head and said, hey, pull this guy off now. You know, don't don't mm-hmm. send him on a road. Don't don't put him on TV yet. We've got something here. And that's just the, the brain of Kevin Sullivan, who I admire so much. But, yeah, there's a story there. Um, I don't know that he got beat, like disqualified, pinned or whatever, but there was a story there, and, and, and Sullivan saw it and said, hey, no, pull him off. <laughs> you go back there and you train and you listen to everything Sarge tells you. And, you know, uh, after that, when he made that debut, it was just, man, it was just. And I'll say this about Bill Goldberg. <laughs> I was victim number 67 in Orlando, Florida. And talking about former football players, uh, now I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just going, I told myself last night not to do this, but I'm going to do it. Okay. Okay. So we're at Orlando Universal Studios. I took him off his feet. <laughs> I did. And uh wasn't uh, devious or anything. It was just one of those things we was talking. And he said, well, work out here just a little bit with me, you know. And I took him down. And Arn Anderson walked by the ring and went, Bobby, don't take him off his feet. <laughs> That's a straight shoot, man. We was just goofing, though. And uh, he was like, you know, because he was only doing those two- and three-minute matches. Anyway, it kind of surprised them. But it, but I showed them here, you know, I was just showing them little things that, you know, how you could do these things. I took him down, and he was like, what? How'd you do that? And I was like, I don't know. You know, got lucky. And, and I really, it was really one of the things we was having a good time with. This is the only one Mr. Screwed that, you know, and say, oh, yeah, I'm bragging about that because I'm hmm. not. I'm just telling you, it's just we was just, just kind of working but kind of playing to, to set up something. But when Arn said it, he said, Bobby, don't take him off his feet. And kept on walking out like he was going to lunch because it was in between. We was doing the uh, the worldwide tapings. So with that said, we had to work out our match. <clears throat> and so I said, hey, you know, yeah, let's stop fucking around here. And I said, how about this? And I set up the match. I know it's supposed to go, you know, like a minute and a half or whatever. And my point is, talking about playing football, and that's this. When we had the match about you know an hour and a half, two hours later, when the next taping come up or what have you, I hit him with a couple forearms, and I said, you know, don't sell him. Obviously, boom, boom, I hit him. I go to a corner. As I come out of that corner, because I he, I, I spin around because I'm doing this old man sell, like you know from the turnbuckles the way you're supposed to, like you're fucking selling your back because they hurt. And Bill Goldberg speared me, and when he did. He speared me out of his boots, and how do I know that? Because once he speared me, no idea where I was at. He picked me up and jackknifed me. The next thing I know, I was walking past production, and Terry Taylor said, man, your head came awful close to the mat. Did he take care of you? And I remember my mullet, which we'll talk about in the future again. <laughs> my mullet, and he swung me over, and that, that jackhammer suplex, uh, my hair touched that mat. You know, it's close. But he snapped me back and took care of me. Uh, but, yeah, he took very good care of me in the ring and i appreciate that but he knocked me out of my boots and the way i know it because when i got in the back nick patrick said bobby because <laughs> he didn't know what this winning streak was or was and i kind of figured out i was around 67 at that point but anyway he said up to this point i don't think he's ever speared anyone as hard as he speared you by the way your boots are out there in the middle of the ring <laughs> <laughs> And I was still dazed going on, you know, just laughing because uh, he did take care of me. And Taylor put me over because that was one of my main agents there as far as, you know, asking me how he worked. Bob Eaton was right there like, hey, how was it? Everything OK? Because he had been working with him. Sarge, them guys all made sure, you know, and of course, I gave him a good report. What am I going to do? You know what I'm saying? He took care of me. There's no reason to go in there saying, no, he was stiff or he was this or he was that. He wasn't. He was professional. And I never forget before going out, he thanked me. He said, hey. It's the boss's decision. I get it. And he goes, I know you've worked around. Let's have fun. And I said, man, you know, we already had some fun earlier. You get down to business. I know what my job is. We laughed, shook hands. We walked out. Boom, that was that. So there's my Goldberg story. That's pretty awesome. (laughs) So so it was you, Nick Patrick, Terry Taylor, Bobby Eaton. You guys could have formed a a four-man group. (laughs) 
called the Mountain of Mullet, and, and it would have been a fucking awesome group. <laughs> I think so, man. I think so. But, yeah, no, that's the people I talked to on the way out of the ring that were sitting in a different place, you know, watching and making sure Goldberg. God knew what my job was. They knew I was going to do my job. They yeah. want to make sure he take care of the talent and those type things, you know. So it's always one of those, you know, that's a really good deal. Though. That but is, that's a good idea. A mountain of mullet. Here we come, baby. <laughs> we're bringing that is, back. <laughs> that, that is one of those things. So when, when I watch those matches, and keeping in mind, I mean, you worked with these guys. You took these bumps. Me, I'm some jack off sitting on the couch, you know. But there are moves that <laughs> hey, you I'm see. I'm just jacking off on my couch. <laughs> oh, I know. But there are moves I see and go, how in the fuck aren't these people crippled? And that his... His spear, especially when you compare it to, like, say, uh, Edge's spear that he did later, where he would gently caress them on their way to the mat, yeah. fucking Goldberg's spear looked like it would cut somebody in half. And, well, uh, and you know, Rhino's gore was the same way. You're just like, holy shit. Yeah. Terry had those big old thick thighs, man. Rhino hit you, Rhino hit you. Um, yeah, you know, I pay for that every day. Um, yeah. But but I did what I wanted to because I cause I loved it you know I loved it and um, it's not ballet out there and when Goldberg stuck me a fat spear it wasn't gentle you know but here's the thing I know what I signed up for and it happened and boom boom that's that you know I wish no ill on anyone but I do wish this just kind of speaking of this when you think long term I wish some of these young guys are out there today. I hope they, especially if you're making money, obviously try to save your money, but also watch some of these bumps. Your body only has so many bumps. When you're out there doing these crazy stunts and, and shit that doesn't have anything to do with pro wrestling, you're going to pay for that one day. And, and I wish that these young guys would slow down just a tad and take care of their body a little bit better. I can honestly say that. So with that said, you have anything else to say about Goldberg? Uh, no, it's just, you know, he was, during his high time, man, he was the Superman of pro wrestling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he really was. Bobby, I think we got to move on to number three. And, yes. Uh, we're a couple of big dummies who need to go sit under the learning tree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ernie the Big Cat Lad, Gremlin State University, and he played for the San Diego Chargers. That's who he got drafted by. He played for several teams after that. And I think we talked about that story. You said that learning tree, as he used to say, comes mm -hmm. under the learning tree. And we brought this up before, and I know we're moving right along because everyone knows where we're heading with this. But um, he, uh, he got that uh, key to the lunchroom. He was a basketball player at Grambling. And a football coach come through, and there he was, you know, all six foot nine, and what's he saying, my foot or my feet cover every step or something like that, whatever it was. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, he, he was in there, and he was starving pretty much, and the football coach uh, made an agreement with him, and I can't think of the other guy's name, although by Mike Moneyham on Twitter, he answered us one day. It was several of us in a group chat, and we I said, ask Mike. You know, he knew it, but um, I'm drawing a blank on it anyway. The coach said, hey, you do this. You want it? I'll give you. You come out to football, and I'll make sure you got plenty of food to eat. And they were starving to death, and he got him. That football coach got him a key to the cafeteria, him and his roommate, and so they could go over and get extra food when they needed it if he came out for football. And the rest is, uh, you know, as they say, it's over after that point, man, because he went on to play football there and then make a make a decent living in in professional football. But also back in those days. Guys took side jobs a lot, and it, it's going to be the same thing. It's not like today where these guys got these huge contracts. Guys had to do car salesmen. Maybe they drove a truck or, or, or different little things for odd jobs, sold insurance or what have you. But some of these guys got into professional wrestling, and Ernie Ladd was one of those guys that got into professional wrestling from a football career and um, realized, hey, I'm making more money in professional wrestling yep. than I am playing football, and they stuck with the wrestling and done quite well for themselves. I've always heard, I never got to meet him, but I always heard good things about Ernie Ladd, what a good man he was. So I leave it at that and let you go on about Ernie, the big cat lad. <laughs> well, it's he's one of those guys that he turned out to have not just a body for it, but the brain for wrestling as well. Um, you know, we, we've got another guy coming up here in a minute that is going to be one of those guys that quit playing football because wrestling made a lot more money. Yeah. Um, which was just, that was that time also. You could make a lot more money as a star in wrestling than you could in football. That was just part of the time. Jim Cornette talks about that all the time. Is like, you know, who, who do you think would make more? Somebody that played football or a wrestler, and he'd show you that, like, Gorgeous George made TV star money. 
not, oh, yeah. not professional athlete money. You know, he was making like Lucille Ball cash. And uh, that's kind of what happened with Ernie. He just, he was one of those guys that just, he could do every phase of pro wrestling. Yeah. And, and it was, and imagine if he had never, if they had never lucked into that, right? If they'd never like looked at him and thought, hey, you know, what do you think we should do here? Or if Bill Watts had been a shade or two more racist than he actually was and wouldn't listen to a big <laughs> yeah. black guy. How different would wrestling be? I mean, here's a guy a lot of younger people probably don't know a whole lot about, you know, Ernie Ladd, but he was a big deal in the ring. He was a big heel, I believe, in L.A. as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he was a big deal just everywhere he went, at every capacity he played. And, um, you know, he was also just six foot nine. That's a big son of a bitch. Can you imagine how much food he must have eaten at that cafe? (laughs) Yeah. He probably put the school on budget there at that point. Oh, yeah. All the other other students like, where's our uh, meal tickets? Is this all we get today? (laughs) Two other kids starved to death because they had to feed him. There you go, man. Well, I think you've kind of already mentioned this. Uh, if, if there's someone smart to our program, they probably already know who our number two is because of what you said there. And uh, I, I wasn't sure how we can go into that either because I know, you know, but I'm going to say this, Jeremy. Mm-hmm. Tackle made by guess who? Wahoo. <laughs> That's who. Chief Wahoo McDaniel. He's been on a couple of our lists before, and we've talked about him. But he was a guy that also, as you mentioned when you saw about Ernie Latt, he, he started making more money in football, or excuse me, in professional wrestling than what he was making in, in pro football. And uh, when he finally got, he played for a couple of different teams here and there. Uh, but when he played for the Jets, he had, I'm sure he had it in the other places too, but when he had his name, uh, he had Wahoo on the back of his jersey when he played for the Jets. He made 23 tackles in a single game <laughs> yeah. against the Denver Broncos. And uh, that's when the PA announcer, as a gimmick, would always say, you know, they announce tackle made by, and everyone would say Wahoo, and he'd say, guess who? And they say, Wahoo, that's who, you know. Yep. So uh, I don't think we can – We've put him over before, but if, if you'd like, please, him and Ladd go right up there. Uh, great football players, great athletes. That's the thing. Ernie Ladd played basketball. Wahoo, from my understanding, was fucking a great golfer. Uh, 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 he ran. He ran. Uh, he played uh, shit. Uh, oh, he was a good fisherman, I think. He was just all around. We talked about that before. All around, hell of yeah. a good athlete, man. And he's out here, and he's playing pro football, and he starts making more money in professional wrestling. And uh, done quite well for someone that transit, you know, made that transition from football to professional wrestling. Well, yeah, and he's so one of those number- guys. You know, he was a colorful character, which helps in wrestling. Um, and like you're saying, he's a sportsman, a fish hunt, raced, wrestle. You know, I just he probably never met a, a physical activity he was bad at. Quite honestly, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and the, the headdress and everything, he knew how to get a crowd to its feet. Uh, he, You know, he's just one of those guys. He just had, you know, that it factor you hear people talk about. Wahoo had it, you know. Yeah. And yeah. people people loved him. I believe he made you almost shit your pants once in a wrestling <laughs> match. <laughs> yeah, I did get the rest. I had that honor once. Yeah. And he said, don't ever tell Malenko, don't ever tell anyone else that Malenko trained you. Never wanna, no one ever want to work with you, kid. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, uh, and, uh, he's anyway, the, he's the guy that called Medusa Michelli to offer her a job with Vern Gagne. Yeah, you you told me I didn't know that. Until yeah. You told me that. That's awesome, man. That would be that would be so, a surreal phone call to get. You know, hey, this is Wahoo McDay. He'd be like, who? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Oh man. So anyway, hold on one second, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm smelling something here. Won't you take us? Into number one, former mm, football players that done real well for themselves in a world of professional wrestling and maybe beyond. Who's our number one? Well, okay, so number one is the <laughs> grandson of High Chief Peter Maivia, the son of Rocky Johnson, probably the biggest wrestling star. I, I, I don't know if you could say he's bigger than Hulk Hogan, but I, I would say that he probably is. Uh, he's an action movie hero. He's a big time wrestler. He's a former football player and, uh, chicks faint when he walks through the room. 
<laughs> one of the biggest rock stars of all time. He is the rock Dwayne Johnson. And that's uh, right, man. I don't know if you can get any bigger than that. He played for the University of Miami, the U. And a quick story, real quickly. I was working in Florida, uh, finishing up, getting ready to head out to Canada. And his dad, actually, I got to do an I Quit match with him. And uh, he was in a locker room just talking to the boys and said, Man, he said, You're not going to believe my son. He's a sophomore at, down at the U. And he's already benching like 500 pounds. He's going to be a big NFL star one day. So he was already bragging about his son. Uh, well, he should have been anyway, I'm just saying. But uh, he was talking about his football career. And he had no idea probably he was going to be one of the world's biggest action stars or movie stars or TV show host. He's got that out now. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but the thing, I have to say this, man. I, I, I'm a big – I watched that uh, Robin and uh, Hello Sunshine in the Morning and on the uh, CNN News. And she was interviewing Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And she said uh, – the rock makes my liver quiver. And I swear, <laughs> I, I, I think the panties were melting off the women around the set that day. I really do. Because it was so real. You could tell none of them was working. It was live TV. And they're doing that morning show, you know. And uh, those interviewed them, I think them them ladies must have, uh, they was all damp that day, I would imagine. So Because she said it. She said, he makes my liver quiver. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, man. Uh, I think he was, you know, down to his last last few dollars or I think he had eight bucks in his pocket or whatever and uh, JR I guess sat down with them and had lunch with them or dinner and and uh, they offered him uh, you know some kind of a deal go here do this do that whatever and man the rest is history he he's just huge but yeah I think he's probably quite happy with himself and well pleased with his life that uh, the NFL or any other uh, part in pro, uh, pro football didn't work out but professional wrestling did so I hope you liked our list I know I did how about you, Jeremy? I, I think it was a great list. You know, Bobby, I have to say, since um, <laughs> since my heart attack, I have been enjoying the show more than I ever have. I have liked our list better. I have enjoyed our our commentary more. This is another great episode. I have had a blast. I, I want to thank everybody for hanging in there with us. I'm just having a hell of a time doing this. Yeah, I am too, and I thank you. I'll tell you how the hell I done it all. I lost my timer. My, it was on my phone, so I'm I'm going to find my phone. Maybe call me later. <laughs> so I just kind of <laughs> lost track because we was having such a good time. And uh, you know, sometimes we spend more on some people than we do on others than our ten, our, our top ten. But we have fun with it. And I have to say, man, it, these last four or five episodes, since you know, I lost track of uh, of when it was. I, I want to say this might be the fifth one back, or maybe the fourth. But anyway, these these last four, including this one. Five, for sure man it's really been uh they've really been fun and i think that's coming across and and if you if you're a fan of the show we appreciate you follow jeremy uh, all that stuff's gonna come up afterwards so i'm not gonna go that i'm just gonna say this if you follow the show go tell one of your friends to follow the show you know give us a like and, and just and tell someone about us man because i think we're really going to grow this podcast because i, I think no i know the love for professional wrestling as fans uh, for of the sport of professional wrestling. Yes, I said sport, and I'm still calling you all fans. That's because I love the sport, and I am a fan. And even though I was one of the boys, I'm still one of the boys. Will always be one of the boys. I'll always be a fan for the wrestling business. It's um, and the podcast is growing, and we just want to tell you guys thanks for listening and share it with someone. So, uh, you know, we'll pick up some followers along the way, hopefully. Yeah. Well, you know, and. Um, I- a couple weeks back, or recently, I don't remember when exactly, I was just poking around seeing where we come up in um, online conversations and forums, and we were in somebody's list of favorite uh, wrestling podcasts, but it said, you know, a little bit worried that the top 10 format might wear itself out. Guys, I need you to look past the top 10 thing. The top 10 thing is just how we start a conversation. That's yeah. that's just that's just shit we hang you know that's like the frame around a picture that's just how we hang it on the wall the top ten thing keeps us organized and it keeps us uh, talking but it's just a way for me and Bobby to get a topic rolling um, it's yep. it's it's more of a cursory glance at what we do than it is the format of what we do so you know I just want right. to put that out there um, and yeah you know what maybe we will stop doing it as a top ten list or whatever but right now it's still working for us and we have a lot of fun doing it that way so Bobby would you like to say anything before we wrap up. No, man, I think you covered it really good. Uh, hopefully everyone that listens to this podcast uh, 
hope your team won in a Super Bowl or, like you said, man, maybe they lost and you're suffering the agony of defeat. But by God, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. And thank you for hanging there with us. And thank all you wrestling fans very much. And thank you, Jeremy. Well, thank you, Bobby. So for myself, Professor Jeremy Vilmer, and for the star of the show, Bobby Blaze, I want to say it's been our pleasure to have you, but it's been your pleasure to listen. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze. You can follow the show on Twitter at Bell to Bell Blaze. You can also follow Bobby on Twitter at BobbyBlaze744 and Jeremy on Twitter at The Geekish Cast. To purchase one of Bobby's books, you can visit tinyurl.com slash blazebook1 to purchase Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boots, Will Travel. And you can visit tinyurl.com slash blazebook2 to get I Kicked Out on 2, The Education of a Wrestler. To donate to the show's podcast hosting fees, you can visit gofundme.com slash bell to bell podcast hosting fees be sure to include a hyphen in every word in bell to bell podcast hosting fees if you follow and listen to the show on apple podcast please leave a five-star review be sure to share the show with any wrestling fan you may know and get on the facebook page where you can keep up with bell to bell fans just like you again thanks for listening to the program and look for the show again next time